Welcome to the Education Week webinar on Helping Children Succeed Through Family Engagement, sponsored by Carnegie Corporation of New York. As a point of entry on today's discussion, let's reflect on what drives Carnegie's interest in this area of work. Research consistently confirms that family engagement is one of the most powerful predictors of children's development, educational attainment, and success in school and life. Carnegie has found that among philanthropic funders, policymakers, and practitioners, there is a renewed interest in supporting family and community engagement efforts. Yet Carnegie has also found that ongoing challenges suggest the need for more effective ways to integrate such efforts into policies, practices, and school designs all while fostering mutual trust and collaboration. As you may already have surmised, the Carnegie Corporation of New York is the webinar sponsor. Education Week is our webinar host, and I'll be your moderator. That means that I've selected the questions you'll hear me ask during the next hour. Education Week is only hosting and moderating this webinar. Opinions are the sponsors and don't reflect endorsements by editorial projects in education or our publications. The sponsor, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, is responsible for selecting the content and the guests. My name is Holly Kurtz, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. I direct the Education Week Research Center, which produces research and analyses for Education Week, including special reports such as Quality Counts. I have a PhD from the University of Colorado at Boulder School of Education, and for 10 years, I was a newspaper reporter who focused on education news. I'm eager to get to today's theme, but before I tell you any more about that, let me highlight a few housekeeping issues. First, please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you're having audio trouble. If you're still having issues, please see the detailed audio troubleshooting file available in the resource list beneath the Q&A window. There are also some other icons located at the bottom of the webinar console that open additional feature panels. You can read about today's speakers in the speaker bio panel and access the resource list to download a copy of today's slide. To submit a question for our speakers to answer during the Q&A session, and I hope you will, type your question into the Q&A box located above the resource list window. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. For context, Carnegie Corporation of New York's education program commissioned the Global Family Research Project to write a challenge paper. The goal is to help stimulate this movement and inspire the field to place families at the center of any approach to student success. The webinar will start with three main topics from the report. Number one, research on the history, current practices, and future potential of family engagement. Two, five high leverage areas that combine to maximize impact. And finally, three, innovative models that combine multiple approaches within schools or systems. We will be hearing from practitioners who are leading this work at three nonprofit organizations, Ed Navigator, Learning Heroes, and Power My Learning. And we'll leave time to hear from all of you during the Q&A period near the end of the hour. Carnegie's goal in the discussion is to identify actionable takeaways that might improve work in this field. We would like to start with the research and Dr. Heather B. Weiss, founder and director of the Global Family Research Project. She writes, speaks, and advises on programs and policies for children and families and serves on the advisory boards of many public and private organizations. Heather earned her EDD from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and conducted postdoctoral research at Yale University. She is the lead author of the Family Engagement Report that Carnegie Corporation commissioned. 
The title of the report is Joining Together to Create a Bold Vision for Next Generation Family Engagement. Note that it's available for a free download from the corporation's website. The URL is Carnegie.org backslash family. To learn about the research and the findings, let's turn now to Heather. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here with my fellow panelists and all of the participants out there on this webinar. Um, as Holly said, we hope you'll come away informed and inspired. This is an amazing time to be doing work in family, school, and community engagement. Um, so I want to start by saying when Carnegie asked myself and my co-authors to write a challenge paper, we asked ourselves, what's the right big challenge to put forward to help move the field forward. To try to figure out that right big challenge, we first looked back and then we looked around at a lot of the innovations, some of which you'll hear about today, that are really driving the leading edge of family, school, and community engagement. So looking at the research and looking at what we saw around us, we came up with four big takeaways. One is family engagement is not new. It's been around and at the center of efforts to create educational opportunity and equal educational opportunity since the 1960s. Family engagement was core in Head Start. There are big provisions for it, the 1% set aside in what was in the 60s called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the first big federal money for education, and it was embedded in home visits, which have now scaled with broad public support. So there is, as a result of all these investments, an enormous amount of research, practice, and policy to draw on, and incontrovertible evidence that family engagement is one of, if not the strongest predictor of kids' learning development and school success and needs to be a key driver in efforts to increase equity. For kids from early childhood, birth, if you will, and beyond. The second thing is the research and practice experience with family engagement shows it's a shared responsibility. All families want and need information about their child's learning and the ways they can support it. Family engagement works when it's a shared responsibility, when families prioritize learning and all those with whom they partner to support their kids' learning and success, early childhood programs, schools, after-school programs, libraries, others in the community, all work to create the conditions and provide the information and support that families need to do effective engagement. Third big takeaway is we know that while the field has learned a lot and there are many powerful programs and evidence that suggests when you invest in family engagement, including for those with low income and other disadvantages around engagement, you can attract them and engage them, we still clearly have a long way to go to serve all families um, and provide them, everyone, with information and support that people need to engage in their children's learning and build learning pathways for their kids from birth on. Fourth, at the same time, looking around, and you'll hear later from the presenters um, from the program, some of the most innovative programs we've got in the country right now, looking around, we saw an, an inspiring number of new initiatives underway the ones today and many others, that really show movement and understanding of the real opportunity we have now to move to more strategic and systemic approaches to engagement so that all families can learn and support their kids' development. So moving to the next slide, what's the challenge? For us, the challenge that we laid out in the paper is how do we work with families and communities to co-create the next generation of family and community engagement, providing equitable learning pathways both in and out of school and from birth to young adulthood, 
that enable all children to see, be successful in the 21st century. We would argue and do in the paper, family engagement is a, an essential part of building kids' learning pathways. So what does it take to meet the challenge? We argue that it means that we need to be thinking differently and engaging differently with families and have families at the center of what we do. It means shifting from devaluing and doing to and for families to valuing and co-creating with them, to seeing families as the huge assets they are, as partners and as path builders. And in working with them, we move toward asking questions, listening, empowering, sharing perspectives and information, partnering, co-designing, implementing, and assessing new approaches and solutions, and supporting parent leadership and advocacy for educational equity and change. Our paper lays out, and the, the programs that you'll be hearing from, lay out a set of examples of what it looks like and when you actually operate in the way we're talking about and are trying to create engagement um, for everyone. So a few years ago, and, and I want to give one example. There are many in our paper, and you'll be hearing from the panelists. A few years ago in LA, janitors in a union were asked, what's your most important thing? And they said, education for our kids. They wanted their kids to succeed in school and be on a pathway to higher education and a good um, employment situation. <clears throat> UCLA's Labor Center worked with the families to adapt the Abriendo Puertas program so that it could be delivered at night. These were night shift janitors delivered at night so that they would learn the kinds of things that they could do on a day-to-day -day basis that would support their kids' learning and development. The goal was to empower families to be their child's teacher, act as leaders and advocates, and see themselves as creators of learning pathways in and out of school for their kids. We also, in our work, said, okay, what's the research telling us about the high leverage areas where we can be investing um, in order to build this strategic family engagement um, that we're all toward build, challenged to build toward? Ed Navigator, Learning Heroes, and Power My Learning are beautiful examples of how you put these levers into action. So these are areas where if you invest and begin to braid them together, so you're not just doing one thing, but braiding these things together as the, the examples you hear from are doing, you're going to get a cascade of broader effects and a likelihood of impact on family and community engagement and on student outcomes. We're seeing lots of synergies across these levers. So in attendance, for example, um, Todd Rogers and his colleagues have put together nudges for parents around making sure their kids are at school. Those nudges have led to then conversations between the parents and kids, so the air message on your cell phone and ground conversations between parents and kids on how they're doing in school and where they're struggling and what kinds of things families can do can, to support kids. So we think of this nudge as the cell phone, but in fact it's unhooked a set of other things. How Are My Learning is another example of that. They provide digital resources in interaction with teachers around homework. In that process, using the phone, parents are doing things like sending pictures of them with their kids doing the work to the teacher. This is building the base for on-the-ground relationships with families. So as you look at these models, think about a whole array of things, including the ways they're operating these research-based levers, putting them together to build the relationships, provide the information, and the support that enable all families to engage and address the challenge that we laid out. Thank you. And thank you, Heather, for this research and context on family engagement in education. Let's learn what the research might look like in practice by hearing from three practitioners who have created successful models of family engagement. Whitney Henderson is Navigator-in-Chief for the education nonprofit Ed Navigator. She is an expert on instruction and started her education career in New Orleans, 
where she moved after Hurricane Katrina to become a founding teacher and eventually a principal at Kip Central City Back Academy. Whitney earned a master's degree from Teachers College at Columbia University and a second master's from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Wendy Lopez of Fleto is also joining us. Wendy is VP of Content and Partnerships at the nonprofit Learning Heroes and a former school teacher. She has 20 years of experience in family engagement, education, and philanthropy. Prior to Learning Heroes, she was at American Express working on nonprofit leadership development, and previously at Scholastic, she played a key role in launching the company's first family and community engagement initiative. Finally, we have Elizabeth Stock. Elizabeth joined Power My Learning 20 years ago, and she says she has helped build that nonprofit into a leader in the use of technology in K-12 education. She has given a TEDx talk and briefings at the White House and the U.S. Department of Education, and she served as an advisor to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the New York City Department of Education. Elizabeth has earned four degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Ed Navigator, Learning Heroes and Power My Learning are using models to engage families, and each of these three models combines multiple approaches to engagement, including out-of-school support, listening through the use of surveys, and helping students, parents, and schools connect via technology. We'll start with Ed Navigator. Whitney, please tell us about your work. Thank you so much, Holly. I'm very grateful to be here with you and so many other innovative organizations, and also very excited to talk about our work. So at Ed Navigator, we focus on making it as easy as possible for busy families to effectively support their children's education. To make it clear to understand, I like to use this example. Whenever we have to deal with complicated processes and make big life-changing decisions, we often turn to professionals to, to get support and to get help. We use real estate agents to buy homes. We get a lawyer when we go to court. We talk to financial advisors about investing money. And these people become our advocates and often help inform and protect us. But that's not the case with education. Where the stakes are very, very high, we often find ourselves, parents and families, that is, alone. And in education, we mostly leave parents and families to figure things out for themselves. And we think that's crazy, and we believe it's a big reason why so many families' dreams for their children are never actualized. But we're trying to change that, and in reality, by doing something different, making sure that every family has a personal education advisor who guides them along the path to great education. And we call them navigators. In New Orleans and Boston, we partner with the leading employers to bring navigators right to the workplace, where working parents already are, so they don't have to go out of their way to get the help that they deserve. I want to share a short video with you that will give you a closer look at our work in action at Latrum Manufacturing, which happens to be one of our largest partners in New Orleans. I think schools and systems often believe that parents don't want to be engaged, but we found that they actually do. So if you, you know, meet them on their own terms, meet them at the place of work, and discuss what's going on in their child's academic life, they become fully plugged in. We're just going to talk about stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the boys. How are they doing? They're doing good. Have they been using those workbooks? As a navigator, I work with families to help support their kids in school. We work with students as young as toddler age, pre-K, and we also service adult learners, and then everything else in between. Materials where she can get more multiple choice practice. It could be either be print and or online. One day I was in the, the break room and I saw these posters about new program coming soon. And I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna need help with educational opportunities because there's, you know, it, it could be very tricky, especially in New Orleans. You really have to do your homework, no pun intended, right, to be able to find the right niche for your particular kids. Well, I'm going to Delgado Community College, and I'm using A Navigator to pursue my associate's degree in business. And I think we just got this. My navigator, she'll come to my job, we'll meet at a coffee shop, anything that's convenient for me, she always work around me. It makes me feel like, you know, Latrum actually cares about their employees. 
Leitrim is a uh, manufacturing company and we've been around since 1949 and we're a proud part of the New Orleans community. And we're always trying to find ways to make our employees' lives easier outside of work so that when they come to work, they can really you know, focus on their work and be productive. By being able to provide them with the resource that adds the value of making sure that their children get the things they need in education, it was really a no-brainer for us. So as you saw, our navigators work with families every day. Through that work, we get an up and close and personal look at how families experience our education systems and schools. And here are a few things that we've learned. So the first thing, families have more choice than ever before, but it can be overwhelming. I really like something that Heather mentioned a while ago, which talks about education engagement as an equal rights initiative. That's very perfect in describing that choice can be very empowering. And in New Orleans, the ability to choose schools is a critically important tool for families. But it also creates new obligations and responsibilities. And as an education community, we have not invested nearly enough resources in ensuring families can truly understand and navigate those choices. And school choice without parent support isn't choice in any meaningful sense. Secondly, families are confused about how their children are doing in school. When we start working with new families, our first step is helping them collect and analyze their children's academic records. So that might be attendance, that may be behavioral reports, report cards, standardized assessment reports. And often, we discover signals that their kids are not on track and have been failing behind for years without anyone really noticing or saying anything about it. This isn't because they don't care or are not paying attention. It's because the information they get from schools is a ridiculous mess. They get lost in acronyms, jargon, percentiles, charts, you name it. The report card says one thing, the test report says something else, and educators say something different. So how do we expect parents to be engaged if they aren't getting honest, accurate information about how their kids are doing? Third, in the many things that schools need to consider, families and their needs sometimes get deprioritized. Schools are incredibly busy places, and I know that from my time from being a teacher and a school leader. But for all the lip service we give to supporting and engaging families, too many schools still put parents and families at the very bottom of the priority list. A lot of basic, important things get lost in the shuffle, like returning parents' phone calls, posting the school calendar on the website, ensuring that someone in the front desk who can help families, um, making sure that they can speak English, surveying families directly about how they feel about the school and their kids' education. If we want parents to be engaged, we have to treat them like respected partners whose time is valuable. And last but not least, many ed-adjacent stakeholders are convening and making decisions on behalf of families, but rarely with them. So again, a point that Heather mentioned earlier, with is always going to be stronger than for. Community engagement efforts are now a common part of the work plan for any education initiative, but these efforts are often shallow and restricted town hall meetings, surveys, public hearings, et cetera. But many of the families we support can't participate in those opportunities. They have to work. They have to take care of their family and their children. So maybe they don't have the Internet or maybe they don't have a computer at home. So what happens is their voices and perspectives never make it into the PowerPoint slide. So all of this is why we do what we do to help more students and families stay on track for success and to make it clear that they deserve an advocate who can help them plot the course for success. Our goal over time is to make sure that this kind of support is accessible to parents and families all over the country so that in a very collective approach, employers can get back, families can get help, students can thrive, schools can get stronger, and communities can get engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney, for that overview. Next up, let's turn to Wendy Lopez Aflito from Learning Heroes, who will talk about the importance of listening to parents. 
Thank you so much, Holly, and um, to all of the organizations participating in this and to all of you who have joined. So excited to be part of this conversation today. Um, so Learning Heroes is a relatively new organization. We're actually turning five this year. And our mission is, is pretty simple. It is to inform and equip parents so they can best advocate for their child's success in school and in life. And we start all of our work by listening really closely to parents across the country to understand their mindsets. And this includes their concerns, their priorities, their needs, what they understand, what they need more clarity on as it relates to their child's social, emotional, and academic development. And as you can see from this slide, this is sort of where we have found our niche in the family engagement space. There's so many great organizations doing so much work um, to, to help families. <clears throat> we have found our area in really doing an unprecedented amount of both quantitative and qualitative research, including over 100 focus groups, dozens of in-depth interviews with parents, teachers, principals, and students, uh, 10 national quantitative surveys, um, and the dark blue states on the map indicate where we've done qualitative research as well. Um, and so we've shared all of this data and insights through four national reports. Um, also sort of importantly to note is that our target audience is low-income parents and families of color. And so in order to be able to segment the data and best understand uh, the nuances of parent mindsets, we always oversample with these groups through um, our research. And so uh, informed by this parent mindset research, we have become laser focused on tackling the issue of helping parents get the more accurate picture that they need and deserve in order to best support their child at home and best partner with their child's teacher. And this is guided by the data um, that, that we uncovered three years ago and have continued to see since then. And that is that a startling 90% of parents across race, education, and income levels believe their child is at or above grade level in math and reading. And so if you compare that 90% to the national and state data that I know we are all so well versed in, that unfortunately indicates that only a third of our stu students are at grade level. And for many of our communities, that number being even lower, you'll see there is a huge disconnect between parent perception uh, and the reality of student grade level achievement. Um, and that's disheartening to us because we know from our research as well that parents hold themselves responsible. Um, they want the best for their children and they know that they can make a huge difference. They just often don't know how. Um, and so in addition to the national and state data, we also know from a recent study commissioned by Scholastic that only 39% of teachers say students start the school year prepared for grade level work. Uh, some of the other data points on this slide um, just sort of round out and indicate the other examples of, of this, as we call, sort of rosy view that parents understandably have. And so, for example, 77% say their child's school uh, is, is pretty good or excellent. So through these national studies, um, we've dug into these issues and nuances related to this disconnect, uh, and we share them broadly with the field. Again, that's sort of where we have found our niche in the family engagement space. Um, and it's really all um, with the end goal of helping us all more effectively communicate with, and as Dr. Weiss, you know, really stressed so importantly, co-design and co-create with, right? So in order for us to co-create, we believe that we really need to first understand where parents are coming from and where they are uh, and, and really meet them there as the experts of their children. Um, so given that we are not a direct service provider at Learning Heroes or a household name, we're, we're aware of that, um, we know the importance of building trust with parents. And we're honored and humbled by the amazing group of partner organizations, um, several of which are, are on the line today as part of this webinar um, and that you see on this screen. And so our partner organizations use our research and insights and tools and resources as part of their existing parent outreach at national, regional, and local levels. Um, and our partner distribution strategy um, really intentionally includes a, a surround sound approach to reaching families in the various places and touch points in their everyday lives. So you'll see our partnerships range from media organizations like Univision and WNET, 
to national organizations like National PTA, Needles US, National Urban League, um, and many others, such as faith-based organizations, uh, you know, state and local department agencies, um, a, a nice wide range um, that we are just so privileged to be working alongside with. Um, so as part of our parents' 2018, our latest study, we wanted to dig further into this disconnect that I again mentioned we've been seeing over the past couple of years to, be, to better understand it, um, to understand what's at the root of it and how we can address it. And what we found is that there is good news. We believe that the issue is solvable and that we can help parents have an a more accurate picture by sharing a few pieces of existing data um, and doing it in a way that is clear, that is understandable, and that is actionable. Um, so, for example, in our Parents 2018, um, we did a split sample, um, and we um, showed parents. Um, we, in, in one uh, split sample, we said, you know, okay, your child is receiving a B in math um, and does not is not meeting expectations on the state test. And so that... Um, close to 90% of parents who, who believe their child's at grade level, that dipped to only 61%. Um, and then with the other sample, we showed them three pieces of existing information. We said, you know, okay, your child's receiving a B in math, they're not meeting expectations on the state test, and also, you know, their school received an overall performance rating of C. And with those three pieces, those three data points, that 90% dipped to 52%. So for us, um, that indicates that that shows a, an opportunity, right, to really um, ensure that we are communicating with parents, that we are helping them see that uh, in addition to report card grades, that there are these different measures, there's these different um, uh, indicators that can help them see and better understand their child's progress. And so at Learning Heroes, um, allowing that data and all of the insight from what parents tell us, we are um, really focused on that surround sound approach, as I mentioned, through our partners, and then really creating resources that are guided by our resource. And um, just to share an example and sort of three main categories of our work, we have the first is we do uh, three seasonal campaigns. Um, and these are designed to provide parents with actionable information at key transition points of the year, all, again, focused on the accurate picture. And so, um, for example, we have Spring Ahead, which is all about helping parents prepare their child for the annual state test and also helping parents um, see how the state test results can, can help them in having um, that bigger picture um, around their child's progress. The second is what we call Summer Stride, and it's all about helping parents really use the summer as an important transition point um, and an opportunity to see how their child has learned uh, specific skills that are needed for the next grade. And finally, we have our Back to School campaign, which is all about helping parents um, set their child up for success in the new year. So those are sort of our, our three touch points um, to help parents um, throughout the year. Then we have um, our more evergreen tools that are, again, all informed by our research. Um, and, for example, we have the Readiness Roadmap, which is really designed to be um, a guide for K-8 parents um, and showing them how they can support their child's social, emotional, and academic development. Um, and it includes interactive tools, videos, and more. Um, and the latest addition, we believe sort of the most innovative um, tool that we've created to date as part of the readiness roadmap is called the readiness check. Um, and it takes just a couple of minutes. Um, students answer three to five questions in math and reading, and parents immediately see how their child is progressing with grade level skills that are needed for the following year. Um, and then they're immediately connected to highly curated uh, skill-specific resources um, that they can use to learn and practice at home. And in fact, we partnered with Power My Learning um, on some of the math curation uh, for those resources. 
Finally, as part of the readiness roadmap, we also have some uh, resources, example questions, prompts to really help strengthen parent-teacher communication, which we know is so critical. Um, and then we have other resources all based on sort of the issues and areas that parents um, tell us are important to them, such as college finance, uh, financial planning. And then the third bucket of our work um, is really technical, ex technical assistance, and that includes using our research um, insights to build capacity within the field and communicating with parents. And so some examples of that um, include um, we've provided technical assistance to states like um, Texas. Um, we recently helped them with their Login and Learn More campaign that was all about helping parents understand their state test, the STAR, um, more and gaining access to um, the, the score reports. Um, <clears throat> we've also worked with the um, National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic um, Development around their How Learning Happens campaign. We've worked at local levels as well, um, such as with um, A Plus Pittsburgh um, and, and their Remake Learning uh, effort. And then finally, we've also provided um, some support with states um, around specific issues, such as the um, parent-facing school report cards. And so we created um, a report card template really from the ground up. Um, and so I've worked with states who are just doing incredibly innovative work, such as Texas, New Mexico, and Massachusetts. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is sort of, those are three seasonal campaigns to the right and then to the left um, is just an example of the school report card template. Um, and all of our bilingual resources are available at BeALearningHero.org. Thank you so much. And thank you um, for that framework. Let's now turn to Elizabeth Stock, who will tell us how Power My Learning works on relationships among students, teachers, and families. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you for introducing or including me in this webinar. So when I think of family engagement, I see a triangle representing a system of learning relationships. So imagine students at the top teachers on the bottom left and families on the bottom right, and arrows between them representing learning relationships. So many ed tech organizations, they look at this triangle and they rub their hands together and they say, oh, I could build some really great software to do what the teacher does. Or I could build some really great code to do what the family does. But what this does is it pushes the teachers and families out of the triangle and replaces them with screens. So at Power My Learning, we think that's a grave mistake. Instead, we use technology to strengthen the learning relationships or those arrows of the triangle. Now, this might seem like a small nuance, but it has really big implications. How big? Well, over 20 years, we at Power My Learning have seen that students are most successful when supported by strong learning relationships in the triangle. They do better academically and social emotionally. We see better grades and test scores and better youth development outcomes. Now today, I'm going to talk about something new at my organization, uh, family playlists, which are interactive homework assignments given about once every two weeks. Students are asked to teach their family partner what they're learning. The family partner then tells the teacher about the experience, and the teacher then uses that data to better meet the needs of their students academically and socio-emotionally. Now to give you a feel for some of these steps, I'd like to show you a brief video taken in the South Bronx. And as you view it, Envision the triangle I've been talking about and how this intervention is affecting it. Okay. Let me do that now. First, I have to teach you what a tree diagram is. That's right, so go ahead. Okay. It's actually kind of fun because, you know, we joke around. He's a big jokester. <laughs> so, by making. The communication with the teachers and, and the power of my learning is, I love it. I love it, because um, the communication is there. Paper, scissors, paper. <laughs> no, no. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Power My Learning has become sort of a clear tenet of how we are approaching our communication with families. We struggled for many years on how to meet our families where they're at and how to have a conversation that was not something as simple as, did you finish your homework? 
So when Power My Learning came up with this idea around family playlists and the idea that students would be actually teaching somebody in their home, it was a perfect match for us. So your job, if you look at your student prompt, you need to take a photo of the tree diagram. What we're trying to do is really bring technology in to build the tools and the programs that can help teachers and principals uh, leverage family engagement to improve student outcomes. Family playlists is something we're really excited about. If I were a sixth grade teacher, I can assign a family playlist to all my students. The family partner receives the family playlist on their phone in their language of choice. Uh, and then a student actually does the first three steps on their own. But the next step is really where the magic is. And in that step, they then teach their family partner. So here on this slide is an image of the triangle I was talking about earlier. Now in the video, did you see family playlists strengthen the learning relationships? I mean, I think, I think of it almost as the arrows being lit up. Now, you may be wondering how Power My Learning came up with this idea, and the answer is we leveraged the strong evidence base from the TIPS program at Johns Hopkins and the learning science around the protege effect, also called learning by teaching. We all know the adage that, you know, you don't really know something until you can teach it, and research shows that this learning by teaching strategy is really powerful. We think it can be especially so for English learners because when they teach a family partner, they're able to use their first language. And giving students an opportunity to use their first language is something that has been shown to increase academic success. Now, we want to scale family playlists, and we have a particular interest in ensuring family playlists meet the needs of disadvantaged children and youth in this country. So in order to scale, we need to understand the common barriers existing in underserved communities. And these are the technology barrier, just 50% of households earning less than 30,000 a year own a computer, the knowledge barrier, many adult family members lack the content knowledge to help their children with schoolwork, and the language barrier, more than one in five school-aged children speaks a language other than English at home. So how can we address these barriers? First, Family Playlist uses mobile phones. Recent data shows that a, that a full 92% of households earning less than 30,000 a year have a mobile phone. Second, because students teach concepts to their family partners, the family partner does not have to have the know-how to play an effective role. And then third, family playlists are available in 12 languages and include auto-translation to help teachers and families communicate. Since launching Family Playlists about two years ago, we've been learning a ton. The quotes on this slide and the video you saw show how enthusiastic everyone is about Family Playlists. And given this enthusiasm, we have three primary goals over the next few years. First, we want to continue to build the evidence base and do continuous improvement. We have developed a plan with Project Evidence to do just that and are learning so much. We are seeing increases in confidence and persistence amongst the students. And we just finished analyzing data we received from the New York City Department of Ed, which showed that family playlists had statistically significant and positive results on math achievement at three Bronx schools, including the school in the video. But that is only the beginning. We have so much more to learn. Second, we want to scale family playlists, and we've engaged Deloitte to develop a state-by-state -state rollout strategy. We will be raising growth capital to fund that plan. And third, we want to spread the idea of the triangle and bust the myth that family engagement is not a worthy investment. When we meet parents where they are, in the language they speak, and do so using the technology they own, we can successfully show that all families want to engage and all families can play a role in the success of their children. Now, if any of you would like to try out a family playlist, you can do so. Just pull out your phone, go to your browser, and enter joinpml.org. That's joinpml.org. And reach out to me and tell me what you think. Thank you so much. And thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks also to all our participants for sharing their expertise. We're now going to open it up to our audience for any questions that you might have. Um, and I think I'm going to start um, with um, a couple questions that were submitted by uh, members of our audience as they registered for the webinar. Um, here's a question from Lisette, and she wants to know, we find the hardest part of family engagement is getting teachers to understand that although building relationships with parents at the beginning of the year may take a little extra time on their part, the 
benefits of these relationships are great throughout the year. What research or strategies do you recommend that we can share with teachers? And I can join to, to answer that first one. So teachers are so valuable to the relationship and making sure that they're very clear that the data that they house within their classroom and the data that they're continuously collecting throughout the school year is going to be a really key point to transformation within the household. So one of the things that they can do is be very transparent on how students are doing and giving more than one or two or three proof points throughout the year to make it very clear on how kids are progressing. So oftentimes, the report card is a tool used to communicate progress. And teachers sometimes don't take the extra step or the extra initiative to call parents in between those nine weeks and inform them of how a student may have done on a particular reading exam or not even anything related to an exam, just actually thinking through how am I seeing a very qualitative um, type of progress within the kid's academic performance. And so transparency is one big bucket. And I think a second big bucket is just thinking about ways that they can engage families outside of the school. So there's a huge currency or currency, I'm sorry, that's placed on how students are um, performing in a very social, emotional way. And there are many ways in which families are thinking about that too within their households. And so the home routines that families tend to set up in their own space are oftentimes mimicked and modeled by what school teachers are actually doing. So with the absence of that conversation to see, what are you doing at home that's working with the student? Or what are you doing within the classroom that's working with the student? Until we're able to really magnify that and make sure that this is a way in which families can continue to build upon processes and steps that are already proven to be successful for students, it's always going to be a very missed opportunity. So I want teachers to walk away knowing and feeling that a lot of the power in unleashing what a child can actually do and be is really rooted within the data that they're collecting um, incrementally every single day. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and here's, here's a kind of related question. Um, also from a, a pre-submitted question from something represented for the <laughs> webinar. And this is from Karen, and she wants to know, is there any work being done or research being done to train principals and administrators in the work of the importance of family engagement so they can implement these changes at the school or district level? So this is Elizabeth. We definitely work with principals. Um, you know, we, we make sure that the data that teachers can see, they can see as well. I mean, one of the things you may have noticed on my quotes slide was that one principal was saying, oh, I can finally see family engagement, because family engagement is very hard to see. You can have many events during the year, and you might know that um, like 20% of your students came, of your families came to the first one, 80% came to the second one, but you don't know if 100% came to those two. So it's, it helps you to have like longitudinal data and almost like CRM data about, t about family engagement so you can see if any families are falling through the cracks and makes, uh, make effort, extra efforts uh, to get them engaged. Okay, this, great. This is Heather. So I think um, we've, learned, we've learned the hard way that if you don't train and engage principals and superintendents, you're not going to get uh, beyond what we call random acts of family engagement. Um, you know, a teacher here doing something, whatever. So unless we are better at the kind of thing that Elizabeth has described and other people are trying to do around engaging the, the superintendent, the principal, um, we're not going to get to where we need to go. Okay, great. Thank you. So we got a couple, several questions about uh, phone contact from people um, who register for the webinars. Uh, for instance, we had one participant who says that um, she's in a rural, high poverty area where a lot of people don't have internet at home or good cell service or cell phones at home. Um, another one, another person who said that a lot of parents at her school um, change their phone numbers often and she wonders how to keep up, um, you know, with that. And so I'm wondering if, if one of you could maybe address sort of um, technology-related um, challenges when it comes to family and parent engagement. So this is Elizabeth. I'm happy to jump in on this one. Um, we've been 
uh, really focusing very hard on making sure that if there are any barriers that block families from being involved, uh, particularly with the family uh, playlist work we've been doing, that we kind of address those. So uh, we thought a lot about how to make sure that the program can work in rural areas, and we have an ability for uh, families to involve, be involved in just using SMS technology. And if that doesn't work, then there's an ability for the teachers to print out individualized pieces of paper for the students, and then the students can take them home and the families can just text in a code, which gets all the information back into the system. So we're trying to come up with every possible way. Uh, we haven't seen any of our schools use that paper-based method yet, so we haven't hit the point where that's been an issue. But we, we're always thinking about what could come up next and trying to make sure that this could be usable for everybody. Great, thank you. So we have a couple questions from our live audience, um, and, they, and these questions pertain to whether or not any of these models are available or could be available for the um, pre-K level. Absolutely. So this is Whitney. And at, at Navigator, one of the things that we care a lot about is making sure that kids, again, are wholly developed and making sure that they also have the opportunities and the access and the resources that they need to be able to do that. And so we work with kids as young as six months. Um, we thought about developmental milestones, um, what they should be for their particular age groups. And we know that before you even enter K-12 education, there's a subset of just information and knowledge that you need, um, and those foundational skills are going to be very important to the type of education you access and how you're able to access it. And so we often work with mothers, even those who are expecting currently, to just make sure that they know, again, what communication should look like for their children or could look like for their children, um, what particular milestones need to be um, addressed so that kids are actually healthy and able to meet particular learning goals or learning needs that they may have. And so that's one approach that we use. Great, thank you. Here's a question from our live audience from Lena, and she's wondering if you all consider it necessary to create different family engagement tools or strategies for immigrant or non-English speaking parents versus um, parents who are not immigrants and, and, and do speak English. Yeah, this is Wendy, and I can I can take the speak to that one. Um, I definitely think it's you know we have seen and and um, invite you to check out our parents 2018. Um, it's an interesting analysis around sort of different segments um, of parent mindsets, um, and you know it's it's often even more nuanced um, than just race um, and. You know, I would say that it's not just about creating different strategies and tools, but being aware of the different kinds of um, the different kinds of barriers and what they look like. Um, so, we, for example, we work really closely with UNIDAS US, um, formerly NCLR, and they have an amazing um, uh, parent-led parent workshop series um, working with immigrant families, and they've been able to use some of our resources um, with with those communities, and they are just um, they take such a, a, a meaningful strength-based approach um, and just meeting parents where they are um, and going into the communities and working around their schedules um, and being, you know, I think somebody mentioned this, just really mindful of jargon, right? A lot of these families, um, you know, may have limited education levels themselves. Um, you know, they're new to this country and don't necessarily know how to navigate our system. So I think it's just really being mindful um, and again, this is where listening to parents and understanding their needs, um, it's, it's just such an important place to start. This is Heather, and I would, I would point you to some examples in the paper that, that we wrote, um, and also some work we're going to be releasing soon on how you kind of co-create with families, including um, immigrant families. In the paper, there's a nice example of a, um, a person who put together um, with Hispanic families, a culturally um, uh, rich approach to math education. Um, so it goes with this notion of seeing families and what they bring to the table in terms of culture and other kinds of, um, you know, real assets um, in order to co-create with them 
things that will work for them um, around helping their kids develop the skills, for example, in math um, that, that we know they need. Um, so this is, you know, the, the, the area of how we value, um, you know, and engage, I think, is an area where a lot of good work is going on. Great. Thank you so much. Here's another question from our live audience from Rebecca, and she wants to know if you could recommend a single immediate action item for implementation to further a school district's family engagement work, what might the most impactful change be? This is Elizabeth. I think the family engagement space is like an ecosystem, and I think the work that all three of the organizations on this call are doing are almost like puzzle pieces that snap together to make a full puzzle. So I think it's really a question of, from the district's perspective, which of the options of the things that are out there, whether it's those of us on this call or other types of activities being done by other organizations, like what's the lowest hanging fruit that you can grab and show success and then work your way up? I, I think uh, we laid out the levers um, in our paper and we deliberately left question marks um, as a placeholder for other ones that people may well invent as time goes on. Um, I think school districts should start by listening to families and providing them with information about, you know, the levers and other kinds of things so that the choices of the key thing you do as your starting point are heavily informed by what parents want. And I would, I would point you to a story in, in our paper from the Zavala School in Texas where, where the starting point was around actually health care, community organizing health care. That morphed into education, and then it morphed into a whole set of things that became co-led between the parents and the school. So think about not just the starting point, but what's the starting point that's going to engage families and get them then helping co-create something that's bigger and richer, which will involve some of the things that I think we jointly, uh, families and, and models like the ones we're talking about today, think are important. So for me, it's that let's, let's walk our talk here and then engage them, and then a cascade of benefits I think will happen as parents understand more. You know, they understand their kids aren't doing well. Okay, sh show me the things I can do to help my child. And that's what all of these models are doing. You get information, and if your kid is not doing well, here are the things that we can offer and some we can co-create together, like the math example, that are going to move things forward. So there's, a, there's an evolution to this, a starting point with a deliberate notion of how are we going to build this into something that addresses the set of things that families need and provide them with the support and the voice to move it forward. And this is Wendy, just to build on that, um, couldn't agree more for us, it's, you know, just, and it's such an important, um, as a foundation, starting with helping, you know, really uh, ad advance this notion of giving parents the accurate picture that they both need and deserve. And it's also that they can best support at home and best partner with teachers. And so for us, that's really an important starting point of, of listening and responding to parent needs. Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And so I am going to ask a question um, that's come up in different forms a few times from our live audience. And that is um, people saying, well, what happens if, you know, teachers maybe have prejudices or bias that make them sort of hesitant to connect with families? How do you start uh, working with um, teachers to start scratching away at prejudices? This is Whitney. I think that's a very controversial question because we know that belief then leads to action. And if teachers work in a space with children and they don't believe that, you know, there's, there's the ability for behaviors to change, particularly around their children and the adults that raise the children, then that's a very tough spot to be in. And when it comes to a school leader's responsibility in coaching and training teachers, one of the things that professional development should always lead with is, one, understanding the culture of the teachers, um, I'm sorry, the students and the families that they work with and work for and support, 
Um, and then also understanding their communities because through that understanding then lends itself to empathy. And empathy is going to be that one lever that shows teachers why it's important to engage more with, you know, oftentimes what may seem as the other, but that other experience is what's truly going to be key to transformation. You can't really work and support with something that you don't believe in. So belief is definitely something that school leaders want to make sure that when they're hiring, they have a subset of teachers who do have strong belief. And if it's on the development side, then making sure that they're putting forth content and development initiatives that really seek to kind of remove the wedge between or the space between schools and families and really working towards a more collaborative approach. Great. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for ha this informative discussion. If you have questions or suggestions or your question maybe wasn't answered during this webinar, um, I'd like to invite you to email Carnegie Corporation of New York's education program at education at carnegie.org. Before we go, I'd like to remind everybody that an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org and on a Family Engagement Resource Center on Edweek and through the Carnegie Corporation. See the URL on the slide on the screen but I'll just say it just all the same, carnegie.org backslash family. Thanks so much to our presenters, our sponsor, and to all of you. We appreciate your interest in family engagement. I'm Holly Kurtz of the Education Week Research Center, signing off.